Someone look at your neighbor, and this is what I want you to say to them. You are not here by accident. <clears throat> You're not. We're actually missing a lot of our regular folks. Some have traveled. Some are sick. Some are on vacation. But we're glad you're here, and I don't believe that a one of you are here by accident because the Holy Spirit has a message for us today. And, you know, every week as I've been doing this um, <clears throat> series on what the Holy Spirit is saying, I've been praying and seeking the Lord and asking Him to show me what the Spirit of God is saying to His people today. Amen? We use the word church, the body of Messiah, the ecclesia in Greek, the called out ones. We are his people. Someone say amen. I had somebody tell me, they're like, well, I don't, they're like, I'm a believer, but I, I, I don't want to be a part of, of a congregation. It's like, well, you're already a part. You may not attend, but you're already a part. You can't be a part and be a believer. Amen. And the heavenly father has called us to be together. There is strength in unity. There is strength in fellowship. Even with Nir up here from Jerusalem, I just met him Friday night at our Sukkah celebration out here. We had a beautiful outdoor Mediterranean feast and prayer for the nations and Sukkah teaching and the lulav and everything else Friday night. And Nir was out there and greeted everybody. And you know, even though I'd never met him, because he loves the Lord, there was a fellowship, there was a unity of spirit, amen? And even though he's in Jerusalem, he is a Jewish believer in Jesus, and he and his congregation love the Lord and are standing for the faith, amen? There is a lot of undercover believers in Israel, just so you know. They're too afraid to confess their faith. I would not, even though I'm full-blooded Jew, and I could have dual citizenship, I would never last in Israel. They would kick me out. I, 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 just, I can't hide my faith. There is no way. It just would be impossible for me. Amen? And I don't believe the Lord's called anyone to hide their faith, to be honest with you. Amen? Even at the risk of persecution, God's people need to stand up for righteousness and stand up for truth. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bless you. We love you. We thank you for the word of the Lord. Father, I pray that you give each of us hearing ears, seeing eyes, and a heart to ponder and understand your word, Father. May the word of God be breathed on by precious Holy Spirit to bring transformation, repentance where repentance is needed, encouragement where encouragement is needed, and life where life is needed, that we might reflect better the character and nature of Jesus our Messiah each and every day, and all of God's people said? Amen. So my message title this morning is, The Holy Spirit Says, God is Holy. Everybody say, God is Holy. God. Now, it's funny, you talk to a lot of people about what it means that God is holy, and people have all kinds of crazy ideas. One preacher he equated holiness with not wearing shorts. Somebody else equates holiness with what you eat or don't eat. Somebody else equates holiness to what you watch and don't watch. Listen, holiness is a reflection of who God is. God doesn't have to try to be holy. He is holy. He is the epitome of holiness. Matter of fact, without God, there is no holiness. No matter what we try to do, it's His presence in the midst of what we do. And it's His presence, His uh, uh, work of His Spirit in our hearts transforming us that allows us to even think about being holy. Now, how is a believer holy? I'll tell you how. It's by reflecting His nature. I think the moon, and I've used this example many times, but I think the moon is one of the finest examples. Because the moon is just a rock of dust and rock and nothingness. Am I right? Had the privilege of buying a new camera, Samsung Ultra 22. I'm pretty excited. <laughs> and after our uh, service, what was it? Maybe it was Wednesday. After our, 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 our class on Wednesday night, I went outside. It was almost a full moon. And it was real bright in the sky. So I tested out my new camera. It's got like a 
a telescope, like a hundred times zoom on it. And so it zoomed in where I could actually take a picture and you could see the craters. That's how crazy it is. And as I was looking at it, I was thinking, wow, it's not a light bulb. It's just a rock. What gives the moon its glory is the reflection of the sun. You and I, I hate to tell you this, but you and I are but clay and dust. We're but a rock. The thing that gives us holiness is a reflection of him. And the closer we draw to him, the greater the reflection of his holiness we're going to bring to a dark and decaying world. I want to start by showing you this picture. Some of you, maybe some who are new, may not have ever heard or know what the Ark of the Covenant is. How many of you have heard of the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant was this special box that was covered with gold and hanged the wings of the cherubs over the mercy seat. It had the poles. It was made out of acacia wood. And this Ark of the Covenant was placed in the holiest place in the tabernacle in the temple called the Holy of Holies. Everybody say Holy of Holies. In the Ark of the Covenant was a uh, portion of manna that was kept there as a testimony. Also, a set of the uh, Ten Commandments was kept there. Aaron's bud, a rod that budded. Can you imagine a, 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 a rod, a wood pole that had been cut? and was blooming for thousands of years, isn't it? And it was all these testimonies, and the top was the mercy seat, where the blood was sprinkled on the Day of Atonement once a year by the high priest for the forgiveness of the sins of Israel, the Ark of the Covenant. Now that you know what the Ark is, let's look at Scripture. <clears throat> I want to turn with me in the Bible, 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 3 and 4. And to give you a little brief background here, the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen by the Philistines at this time, well, before this time, had been taken to one of their cities, and uh, every time they put the Ark of the Covenant next to their fish god, the fish god, his head would come off at night and would be sitting there. And this went on time and time again. Then the people of the city had tumors and had hemorrhoids and all kinds of issues until finally this Philistine city said, we've had enough of the Ark of the Covenant. They put it on an ark. I mean, they put the ark on a, a, a cart and they put uh, new cows on it and the cows took off straight for Israel. Nobody leading it. Straight for Israel. When it came to Israel, it went to a man's house called the house of Abinadab. Now, Abinadab was one of the sons of King Saul. Now, how many of you remember King Saul was the first king of Israel, okay? And so the ark went to the uh, house of Abinadab and was there for several years. And then David, you all remember King David? David became king, and David wanted to bring the, the ark of the covenant from the house of Abinadab into the city of David, into Jerusalem. Because the house of Abinadab, while the Ark of the Covenant was there, had been greatly blessed. And David wanted that blessing and wanted the presence of God in Jerusalem. And so that's where we pick up the story. So they set the Ark of God on a new cart. Everybody say a new cart. This is King David. He brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill, and Uzzah and Ahiah, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill accompanying the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. Now, in Exodus 25, verse 13 and 14, then we're going to come back to our story because this is super important. The Lord says in the Torah, you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings on the side of the ark, that the ark may be carried by them. So remember the poles on the side of the Ark of the Covenant? They weren't there for decoration. Someone say amen. amen. They were there because God had instructed Israel, if you ever move the ark, 
have the priest move it, and they're to carry it on their shoulders, on the poles, God's way. How many of you know God has a way? Matter of fact, he's very particular. Because he's God, he's allowed to be, amen? You may not like his way. You may not like what he thinks or what he says. You don't even have to agree with it. He doesn't make people receive Messiah as Savior. He gives them free will, gives them free choice, amen? But know this, when you do things his way, things turn out much, much better than doing them your way. How many of you testify of that? How many of you have lived any part of your life doing things your way? If I were an octopus, I'd have all eight legs up. Amen? And I can tell you the reason why I am so absolutely in love with the Lord is because His faithfulness, when we submit to His ways, there is such grace and mercy and blessing that pours upon your life, your household, your ministry, every area of your life. Now, how many of you have ever heard of good intentions? Now, I'm going to talk a lot about this this morning. Everybody say good intentions. How many of you know that King David had some good intentions to bring the ark up to Jerusalem? Good thing, right? But good intentions never replace doing things God's way. Let me say that again. Good intentions, my good intentions, your good intentions, never replace doing things God's way. God's way. And the Lord had a very particular way for the Ark of the Covenant to travel. But David, because he didn't research and nobody told him, well, King, maybe this isn't the best idea. He thought, we'll just buy a new cart. He was trying to do it right, right? He got a new cart. Not an old cart, but a new cart. Stuck it on there and he's going to travel it. The only problem is those good intentions didn't matter because it wasn't God's way. How many of you know that the body of Messiah is filled with people with good intentions? But they're doing things their way instead of God's way. And if you don't hear anything else this morning, my prayer is that you'll hear in your life that Heavenly Father is not impressed with our good intentions as He is with our submission to doing things the way he says. Someone say amen. amen. King David meant well when he placed the ark on a new cart. How many of you believe that? He meant well, right? God blesses direction though, not intention. God blesses direction and not intention. What do I mean by that? God knows your heart but cares about the direction of your life. Not just your intention. Well, I mean, well, you know, I prayed a prayer three years ago. I'm not walking with the Lord today, but I mean, well, God is not impressed with your intentions. He wants to direct our lives. Someone say amen. How many people will come on that day saying, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Do main miracles in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And the Lord says, I will turn to them and say, I never knew you, you that work iniquity. See, they had good intentions, but they never submitted the direction of their life to his Holy Spirit and to the word of God. And because of that, he never knew them. So there's a lot of people today who say, Lord, Lord, but whose life reflects only good intentions. How many of you know we have a whole political party has good intentions? They have good intentions for a woman to have control of her body. Doesn't matter if it means the murder of those unborn babies, right? Good intentions for children, not even adolescents yet. If they choose, they were born a girl and they want to be a guy, they're to be encouraged in that. Good intentions. Good intentions can be really evil if not submitted to God. Someone say amen. Amen. So don't ever be impressed by people's good intentions. Heavenly Father is not impressed with our good intentions if it violates the word of God. Someone say amen. Let me read it again. 
Heavenly Father is not impressed with our good intentions if our good intentions violate his word. David had good intentions to haul the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. The problem was it violated the word of God. It was not done the way the Holy Spirit instructed in the Torah. Very simple. Often our good intentions are an excuse, uh uh-oh, to do things our way instead of his way. Have you ever heard this saying, guys? Hell is paved with good intentions. Samuel Johnson said that. Hell really is paved with good intentions. Lots of people in hell who had good intentions their whole life. But they never, ever tried to listen to whether or not their good intentions violated God's word. Someone say amen. Have I got your attention this morning? So the Holy Spirit, what's he saying? He's saying to the congregation, to the called out ones, to the body of Messiah, God is holy. And you and I cannot live by good intentions. We have to live by submitting ourselves to the word of God and make sure that our good intentions don't violate his word. Because how many of you know that our land's getting filled with polluted believers? Progressive Christianity, they call it. There's no such thing. All it is is people who are living by good intentions while their actions violate the word of God. And as men and women of righteousness who reflect God's holiness and light, We need to call a spade a spade. Darkness is darkness. Light is light. One day I could go to jail for saying that. Hallelujah. Y'all write me. (laughs) Most of the evil in this world is done by people with good intentions. T.S. Eliot said that. Listen, you could read Bonhoeffer. I love Now, as a Jewish believer, Bonhoeffer is my favorite German ever because he stood up to the Nazis. He stood up to their evil. And all the people in Nazi Germany with good intentions, he stood up for the Lord and for what was right. 2 Samuel, back to our story, chapter 6, verse 5 through 8. Then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, on harps, on stringed instruments, on tambourines, on sistrums, and on cymbals. I'm not sure what a sistrum is, but... Worship was going on. All the right stuff outwardly. I mean, they were having church, right? The only problem was... They were violating the word of God. It's like somebody living in sexual immorality coming into service on Sunday morning and lifting holy hands to God. They're singing the right songs. The music's playing, but their life is in violation to the word of God. Good intentions, guys. Be careful, they will lead you to hell. What we want as believers is submission to the Word of God and to precious Holy Spirit in our life. Someone say amen. Amen. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, remember all the singing, the worship, all the good stuff's happening, Uzzah, who was the grandson, the son of Abinadab, who was the son of Saul, he was the grandson of Saul, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. The ox was walking, the ox stumbled, the ark started to tip, so Uzzah, with good intentions, how many of you know, man, he was just trying to straighten up the ark, and he grabbed hold of it. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error, and he died there, By the ark of God. I want to read verse 8, then we're going to talk about this. And David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called the name of the place Perez Uzzah to this day, which if 
I'm not mistaken, I believe means outbreak against Uzzah. Was it God's fault? No. And actually, technically, it really wasn't so much Uzzah's fault as it was King David's fault. And I'm using this as an example because David repented of a lot of stuff just like us. Amen? But David had no business putting the ark of God on any kind of cart to start with. So he violated God's word. Then when Uzzah reached out his hand and touched the ark, Uzzah violated God's word. And I'm going to show you in scripture because nobody was to touch the ark. The priest had to carry it on their shoulders with the poles. Nobody touches the ark. It's what God said, just the way it is. Well, I don't think that's fair. Well, you can take it up with the Lord when you see him, amen? I mean this, I don't think it's fair stuff. Dear Lord, leave that to CNN, amen? It's enough to make me crazy. It is what it is. God's God. He is holy. He says, this is the way to do it. This is the way we do it. No ifs, no ands, no buts. And if there's one thing I can tell you about us human beings, we are terrible at following instructions. Absolutely terrible at following instructions. It is hilarious sometimes. There is a little game where you play where you give some instructions to people and they have to actually read them and try to follow them out. And you come up with 15,000 different things. Because everybody reads the instructions different. Listen to me, and this is super important. David had no reason to be mad at God. Oftentimes, we get mad at the Lord because things happen in our life, and the truth is our good intentions violated the Word of God. And we're living in consequences of a prayerless life, a Scripture-readingless life, a life that is void of obedience to God, and we wonder why bad things happen. Just the way it is, right? We would all agree that Uzzah had good intentions to protect the ark. Wouldn't you agree with that? He had good in- He didn't want the ark to fall. He was just reaching out. But the Lord had instructed for the Torah that only the priests were to touch any of the holy things in the ark had to be touched only by the poles. How many of you remember Job and his friends? If you hadn't read the story of Job, I don't have time to tell you the whole story. I'm just telling you, he had some friends that came over and had some good intentions to comfort him. Their advice to Job ended up being this in a nutshell. Because Job was sickly, and he had lost his children, he had lost his bit, he lost everything but his wife, he had lost it all, and his friends came over and said, Job, just curse God and die, basically. Job's like, uh, bad advice, guys, it's not going to happen. And so they go through this whole dialogue, you can read in the book of Job, Job's friends had, listen, Job's friends had good intentions, but you know what? It nearly got them killed. After God healed, listen to me, after God brought healing to Job, he said, Job, you need to sacrifice animals on behalf of your friends so that they don't die. That's how upset the Lord was with their good intentions. Okay? Listen, quick story for you. So when I was a new Christian, I was a new believer, I had... uh, left the church I got saved at, and I was still a teenager, I think almost 20 years old, and I was working as an evangelist, um, not full-time at this time, I was working as an evangelist at a uh, church down the road in Dickinson, Texas, called the Village Church, and there were two young men who were much older than me, I say much older, I think I was 19, about to be 20, they were probably 24 or 25, both of them were former Marines, okay? You ever met the type, big Marine guys, strong and just gruff? But they loved the Lord. And for some reason, I was just a skinny, little, scrawny teenager. And they kind of took me under the wing and would mentor me. So one day, the two of them 
said, Bruce said, you know, uh, his name was Ron, Ron and Steve. And Ron said, you know, Bruce, Steve and I, we're going to go in the morning to the docks because we heard that some of the uh, oyster boats there are hiring and they pay really well. Um, why don't you just come and hang out with us? And uh, I already had a job. I said, sure, that's fine. So up early in the morning before the sun rises, okay, which is the only time you get up before the sun rises if you're going fishing, right? And December, if you know anything about oyster boats, they run in like the coldest months of the year, okay? So it's December, it's freezing cold, I've got my coat, and so they picked me up, I'm in the back of their vehicle, Ron and Steve are in the front, they go to the docks, I stay in the car, and they both go out to talk to the captains. They come back about 30 minutes later, we got there before the boats ran out, and they said, Bruce, they only had one opening. And we wanted to work the boat together, so we gave it to you. So the next thing I know, 10 minutes later, I'm standing on this oyster boat, waving goodbye to my two marine friends, <laughs> heading out to sea, thinking, what in the world am I doing and what did I just do? <laughs> How many of you know my friends had good intentions? But you need to know this. That was the worst job I have ever had in my life. <laughs> By far. I think I lasted a week. I mean, the captain was a drunkard. He'd get drunk. I mean, it was just terrible. The dog was just puking all over. Oh, it was horrible, horrible, horrible situation on sea. And there's no escaping it. No escape. I mean, you're on the boat. So listen, good intentions, if it violates the word of God, is a terrible thing. Amen. And the moral of the story is, sometimes people mean well, but that doesn't mean that it ends well. Amen? Now turn with me in Numbers chapter 4, verse 15. Numbers 4, verse 15. And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary, this is the Torah, this is what it says about the holy things, and all the furnishings of the sanctuary when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Koath shall come up to carry them. But they shall not touch any holy thing lest they what? Die. Lest they what? Die. So God had already warned them not to touch the holy things. So was it God's fault that Uzzah died? How many people blame the Lord for our own misdoings and wrongdoings? Amen? Have you ever met somebody that says, I'm mad at God? Listen, guys, always remember this. God is holy. He is perfect. He does not make mistakes. Your life is not a mistake. You are not a mistake. And if something doesn't work out the way you think it should, it's not God's fault. And if God's not to blame, who does that leave? Only leaves one person. Looking in the mirror, but how many of you know we like, in our culture, we want to blame everybody but ourselves, amen? I've never done a uh, marriage counseling with the husband and wife comes in, the husband says, oh, it's all my fault. The wife says, no, 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 dear, it's all my fault. <laughs> all right, some of y'all caught that. <laughs> we'll just keep going. Several years earlier, this is a horrible story. 50,070 men died because some had opened the Ark of the Covenant and looked inside of it. A definite no-no. How many of you remember that Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? You remember that scene where the German soldiers opened it up and the lightning went from their eyes and they all died? 50,070. Now, some of your versions may say 70, but I looked it up in the original language and it is really 50,070. Now, doesn't mean they were all from the same place, but within that area. Maybe they turned it into a tourist thing and they were allowing people to come and look. I don't know the details other than what the scripture says, but 50,070 of them died in that place because they violated the holiness of God. Someone say amen. amen. Listen, guys, if you don't hear anything else, don't trifle with the things of God. He is a holy God. His holiness has not changed. He has brought his holiness 
into the form of human flesh. I mean, you talk about the Feast of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles. Biblically speaking, truthfully, it's probably the time that Yeshua was actually born was during the Feast of Tabernacles. A lot of reasons for that. But I can tell you this, that God took and tabernacled and took upon himself and robed human flesh and became a man. And we trifle with the things of God today as believers and take things so carelessly. And I just think we need more of the fear of the Lord in our heart. Amen? More of the understanding of, let's maybe not violate the word of God. Let's maybe, maybe Jesus actually means what he says. Amen? And maybe we don't just skip over those parts because it might offend somebody. Maybe we start reading those parts. God is holy, and there is no way to circumvent his holiness. Just can't do it, guys. If you're going to walk with the Lord, he is holy. Pursue peace. Let me give you some new covenant scripture. Pursue peace with all people and holiness. What? You have to pursue holiness? Yes, you do. Why? Because this flesh is anything but holy. This flesh fights you at every corner. Am I the only one? Right? So your flesh has its desires, but those desires have to be crucified, put to death, and you say, nope. I'm going to pursue holiness and pursue the Lord instead of pursuing what feels good for the moment. Someone say amen. amen. Pursue peace with all people in holiness without which no one will what? What? That's new covenant. Maybe God didn't really mean that. Maybe you don't have to pursue holiness to see the Lord. No, that's exactly what he means and that's what he says. Looking carefully. Everybody say carefully. Uh-oh, listen to this. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. What? You can fall short of the grace of God? I thought it's an umbrella you walk under no matter what you do. You can live like you want, do what you want, and you've got your eternal life insurance. That's not the Bible. That's not God. That's Satan lying to God's people, looking carefully, watching, being thoughtful, mindful, lest anyone fall from the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by this many become defiled. If you've got bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart, guys, that's the first thing you need to repent of, just telling you. Matthew chapter 6, after the Lord goes through the Lord's Prayer, at the very end of it, he says this. He says, unless you forgive, you cannot be forgiven. Maybe he didn't mean that either. Unless you forgive, you cannot be what? What's that mean? That means you better forgive everybody. Everybody say everybody. Look at your neighbor and say, God wants me to forgive everybody. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but if somebody wrongs you, you better forgive them. Someone say amen. amen. Well, I forgive them, but I won't forget. Is that what God says about your sin? Well, I forgive you, but I'm not going to forget what you did. What? How, how does that even work, right? No, if you forgive, that's it. It's gone. It's done. How many of you have ever wrestled with unforgiveness in your life? Amen. Listen, I grew up with a terrible childhood. Terrible. I grew up in six foster homes. And never lived with my parents after the age of six years old. And was so bad, ended up in a boys' home where they took all the worst boys and put them in one household. How many of you know that's a terrible idea? Whoever came up with that idea, terrible idea, man. And they take all the worst kids and put us all in the same home. And listen to me, and you need to understand this, guys, that God is holy. He means what he says. He says what he means. Amen? And one of the first things Holy Spirit dealt with me after I became a believer 
was I had to forgive from my heart my parents, all the relatives, all those that I felt had wronged me as a child. Step one was forgive. Matter of fact, if I hadn't forgiven from my heart, I don't believe I ever would have been able to enter into ministry. Or if I did, I'd be totally ineffective. You've got to forgive those who have harmed and hurt you. We've had so much forgiven in our life of the sin that we've brought before God that He has removed from us forever and we can't forgive others. That's for another day, but y'all can take that thought. If it applies, you need to submit it to the Word of God and forgive. Amen? Believers would not be instructed to watch, to look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God if it was impossible to fall short of the grace of God. Amen? Now, I just tell you, I am not one who ascribes to the once saved, always saved false doctrine. Just saying. I know the Scripture. I've been studying the Scripture 40 years. You can't just take one verse and build a whole doctrine around it to give people a false security. Now, I'm not worried about losing my salvation as long as I continue to submit my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the Word of God and not to violate His Word. Amen? But this idea that God can save you from a river that you are sinking and drowning in of sin, and then you can jump back in and you're not going to drown. It's ridiculous. Amen? And actually, I'd call it, I would go so far as to call it a doctrine of demons because it violates the Word of God. Now, it may get some of you mad at me. Love you, but listen, if you want me to agree with you or God, God wins. Just telling you. I had somebody come into my office a while back they're telling me a few things. I'm like, well, okay, but let me tell you what the Scripture says. This is what God's Word says. You may not like it. You don't have to agree with me, but I'm going to side with God every time. Doesn't mean I don't love you. Doesn't mean I don't care. But that's my responsibility. Someone say amen. Y'all still love me this morning? Pursue holiness. Don't make the Lord in your own Imagining. You think people ever do that, guys? You think people ever make God in their own image? They make God to be who they want Him to be, not who the Scripture says He is and who He's been revealed to be? Lest Hebrews 12, 16, 17. So we read verse 14 and 15. It's verse 16 and 17. Lest there be any fornicator, that sexually immoral person, or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. This is New Covenant writing to the church. And Esau, if you don't know the story, he had a birthright. He was the firstborn, right? He was the firstborn. And because he was the firstborn, there was an inheritance that passed to the firstborn. But one day, when he was a young man, Esau was out hunting, and he caught nothing. You ever go hunting and come back with nothing? And he was out hunting, came back with nothing. Well, Jacob was there, and Jacob was cooking the best bowl of lentil beans you'd ever smelled in your life. I mean, it had like this heavenly aroma. You know, if you're ever hungry, really hungry, Something that normally is okay all of a sudden tastes incredible. Anybody ever relate to that? So Jacob's cooking this bowl of lentils. It's unbelievable. And here comes Esau and says, Brother, I'm so hungry. Give me some of your beans. Jacob says, Tell you what, have I got a deal for you. I will sell you a bowl of my delicious hot lentil beans for your birthright, for your inheritance. And Esau despised his inheritance and blessing so much, he sold it for a momentary pleasure of a bowl of beans. And then later he wanted the blessing, and it was too late. He had already sold it. People get on Jacob. That wasn't Jacob's fault. That was Esau's fault. Esau despised his birthright. Now, how does this relate to you and I? 
As a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you and I are sons and daughters of the Most High God. That is our inheritance. That is our birthright. Amen? Yet how many times does Satan and your flesh and the world tempt you to sell out your birthright for a moment's sinful pleasure? Got quiet. Come on, guys. Happens all the time, right? You have to have enough love for the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? Y'all do the Shema there, brother? Near? In your... Y'all do the Shema, right? Shema. Listen, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. Listen. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You've got to love God more than that moment of pleasure of sexual addiction, pornography, alcohol, dear Lord, whatever. Video games. I know people are more addicted to them than crackheads are addicted to crack. It's crazy. So whatever somebody's thing is, you've got to love God enough. Because these are perilous times we live in, guys. And I'm preaching to you straight from the Word of God. And I'm saying to you, your good intentions do not matter if they violate God's Word. Plain and simple. Can we all agree on that? And Uzzah, bless his heart, paid a terrible price, didn't he? Died. Esau hated, despised, thought of no consequence, his birthright, his inheritance. Do believers have an inheritance? Someone say yes. We have a birthright? Yes, I did a funeral one time for somebody. This woman loved Elvis. And she wanted to be buried with all of her Elvis records and cassette tapes and everything else Elvis. And the funeral home granted that. I mean, her casket was stuffed full. But know this, none of that stuff went with her. And as believers, the only thing that goes with us is those things in our life, those works that we've done, for Christ, for Messiah, out of a pure heart before God. That's the only treasure that lasts. We're talking about that this morning too. Your treasure in your home, I hate to tell you, is either going to end up with your relatives or at an estate sale or in the trash. One of those three places. I love going to estate sales. But as I'm wandering the house, I think, did this person invest in anything of quality in the kingdom of God. That's what matters. That's why I preach the way I preach. Because ultimately, we're going to stand before the Lord, and that's the only thing that's going to matter. Someone say amen. Amen. Well, I don't want to hear that, Pastor. It makes me too uncomfortable. It only makes you uncomfortable to your flesh if your flesh doesn't want to go God's way. And that's where you say, flesh, you know what? You're going to go the way I tell you to go. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. How many of you know you can't always do what your body wants it to do? You ever wake up and you don't want to get out of bed and go to work? Anybody? Or am I the only one, right? Wake up this morning like, oh, Lord. You just got to say, body, you're going to do what I tell you to do in the name of Jesus, amen? You're going to get up, you're going to pray, you're going to seek the Lord, and you're going to love God. You're going to go to church, you're going to praise, you're going to worship. Almost done. Bringing it in for a landing. Hebrews 12, 25 through 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, God's kingdom cannot be shaken. Someone say amen. amen. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably acceptably with what? Reverence and godly fear. This is speaking to the church. This is to the body of Messiah. We're to serve God acceptably, with grace, with reverence and godly fear. Listen, the longer I'm in this and the more the Scripture really opens up to me by the Spirit, the more Godly fear and the more reverence I feel I have in my life. Not less, the more. The more. Anybody else out there with me? Or am I the only one? For our God, I'm going to close with that verse, 29. 
For our God is a consuming fire. Consuming fire. What does that even mean to a believer when they hear our God is a consuming fire? Now, it's made for some beautiful songs, right? We've written praise songs about God is a consuming fire. We've written worship songs. But what does that really mean? I'll tell you what it means, and this is what I believe Holy Spirit is saying. I want to leave you with this thought. So the Holy Spirit is reminding us that God is holy. The Father is holy. Everybody say, He is holy. He is holy. holy. And our God is a consuming fire. What does that mean? It means that the closer you draw to Him in your life through prayer and Scripture and fellowship, it's not hard, it's not rocket science, the closer you draw to Him, the more of His holiness will burn away the chaff and the things in our life that do not belong. That do not belong. And all that will be left in our lives will be that which is pure, that which is true, and that which is good. Amen? Let's all stand to our feet. Hallelujah. Every head bowed, every eye closed, saints praying around the room. Father, we bless you. We love you. We thank you for the word of God in the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to minister to every heart, every mind, every individual here. Let's just take a moment and just still our hearts. If you're here today, you're not even sure if you're right with the Lord. You want to be right with the Lord. You want to receive the inheritance. You want to be a son and a daughter of the Most High God. You want to have the hope of eternal life. You want to have true wealth and true riches in heaven. You want your sins to be forgiven. You want to become a new person in Jesus, in Yeshua, our Messiah. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. It starts right here. It starts right now for some of you. Don't allow a spirit of pride to hinder you or to harm you. But with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today, saints praying around the room, and you'd say, I'm not sure if I were to die today that I would have a place in heaven with Heavenly Father. I'm not sure that I'm a son or daughter, but I want to be sure. I've never received the forgiveness of my sin, or maybe you did at one time, but you've fallen back. You've violated the Word of God over and over and over again, but you want to make things right. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He is full of mercy and grace. His mercy endures forever. He is long-suffering and patient, not willing that any should perish. And he's calling you home today.